Hello and greetings from Seattle, Washington. My name is Julian, and this is my weekly Monday morning introduction to philosophy and theory live stream lecture. I'm so glad that you're here because as of this morning, we're going to be starting an entirely new series. This is going to be a three month series titled The Cunning of Reason, which is going to be about the Hegelian dialectic. And if you're a complete beginner, welcome. I'm going to try to make these lectures accessible. And if you're a more seasoned philosophical student, then I think you'll find a lot to chew on here as well. If you're new to this program, um, as I said before, my name is Julian. About two and a half years ago, I started making these free open access philosophy and theory videos online. Uh, since then, we've grown into a global learning community of like-minded thinkers and lifelong students. And I'm so incredibly grateful that I get to host these sessions with you every Monday morning. I also wanted to say a huge thank you to everyone who has already purchased my complete guide to Zizek ebook, which came out two weeks ago. Um, I'm just completely blown away by how many people chose to actually purchase this book and to download it uh, by becoming a patron. That means the world to me and it's really just so wonderful. I feel like it's an enormous vote of confidence for this project. And as a patron, you really do allow me to keep making these videos. So I hope that you'll enjoy the Complete Guide to Zizek, volumes one through eight, which is which runs to nearly a thousand pages. Um, and if you'd like to download that, simply go to my Patreon. The link is www.patreon.com forward dash Julian Philosophy. Um, also, please do drop a comment letting me know where you're joining me from. It always brings me great, great joy to see that we are connecting globally. I see a Dutch expat trapped in the UK. Uh, uh, I hope that you are okay. Um, I see Connecticut flaming hot. In fact, it is very hot here as well. You can see that I'm currently filming in the basement. Uh, Switzerland. Hello, Switzerland. Philippines. Greetings to the Philippines. India. Love back to you. Italy. Hello, Italy. Uh, Vienna, Austria. Um, I was just reading a book about Vienna last night before I fell asleep. Uh, California. Hello, California. Lisboa, Portugal. Bon dia. Uh, Switzerland, Nigeria, Germany, Cologne, beautiful city. Uh, Australia, Florida, unfortunately, <laughs> someone says. Nepal, Belgium, the UK. Um, the UK is going mad. I I don't know if I've missed any news about the UK, um, but I hope that you're well. Okay, uh, thank you guys so much. Uh, I see Pakistan as well. Thank you so much for those comments. Um, I know that it, this might be sentimental of me, but I truly, truly enjoy the feeling that we are connecting around the world through theory and philosophy. Um, that is something very, very special. So thank you guys. Uh, I see Jason from Florida, hello. <clears throat> okay, so I'm quite excited today because more excited than usual even, because we're gonna be launching into a brand new series. And this series is gonna be titled The Cunning of Reason, which is a key Hegelian concept that to my mind remains nevertheless somewhat curiously underdeveloped within theory. And the German for the cunning of reason sounds quite nice as well. It's um, Die List der Vernunft. In fact, I almost thought about calling the series Die List der Vernunft, but then I thought it might be a little bit pretentious to use the German. So the series is going to be called The Cunning of Reason, and it's essentially going to be an introduction to dialectics, specifically Hegelian dialectics, and how important they remain for the understanding of philosophy and theory. Um, <clears throat> but first, I want to give you a very basic definition of, or actually, let's do something else before we jump into definitions. Let's make it a bit more fun. I want to give you a little historical anecdote that actually illustrates the idea of the cunning of reason quite well. Uh, it's a historical anecdote that is attributed to Picasso. And this is when Picasso is working on his famous painting, Guernica, which of course depicts the war atrocities uh, of Guernica. And Picasso is in his Paris studio, occupied Paris, and he's working on the painting. And at a certain point, a, a policeman comes into his studio and the policeman sees all the unfinished works of art in his atelier. And the policeman says, he looks at Guernica and he says, you there, did you make this? And Picasso turns to the policeman and is supposed to have said, no, sir, you did. 
And it's a beautiful little historical anecdote about the true culprit, if you will, of art. As Adorno once said, every, um, every work of art is a crime uncommitted. But you could almost reverse that by saying every work of art is a crime committed, right? It addresses something that has occurred. Guernica is, is not an uncommitted crime, but it is, of course, a painting about a crime that has been committed. And in a sense, therefore, it's not Picasso who has created or painted Guernica. It's the, the, uh, it's, it's the military violence that has created the idea of Guernica in the first place, the need for it to be painted. Now, here we have, in a sense, already encapsulated or illustrated the idea of the cunning of reason for Hegel, which is that Hegel's cunning of reason is a theory about how history works, how history functions. And the basic definition of the idea of the cunning of reason for Hegel, which we'll flesh out a little bit more as this lecture continues, is that Hegel argues that history never simply works according to a predetermined linear narrative. History isn't simply moving towards some kind of divine arc of moral justice. Instead, for Hegel, history always works in a contradictory fashion by means of using human passion against itself. Now, this is very complicated, so let's take it step by step. What exactly does Hegel mean by the cunning of reason? Well, in order to understand that, you have to understand two things. What Hegel means by cunning and what Hegel means by reason, both of which are important conceptual terms for Hegel. First of all, cunning for Hegel is not the same as a trick. In fact, he actually defines the two quite differently. A trick, if you will, is simply when you're trying to fool somebody, when you're trying to, uh, when you're trying to, I mean, everybody knows what a trick is, right? You're simply trying to con somebody, essentially. Whereas um, cunning for Hegel is when you have, when you use somebody against themselves. Think about here the difference between uh, uh, judo, for example, and some other martial arts. In, 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 or for example, boxing. In boxing, you have to hit the other person, presumably, I'm not a boxer. You have to hit your opponent. Whereas in judo, you have to use the weight and the momentum of your opponent against themselves. And that's essentially what Hegel would characterize as cunning. It's that you beat them by allowing themselves to beat themselves. And so you're not really tricking them, you're bringing out their true nature against themselves. Of course, the ultimate philosophical example of cunning in this precise sense is Plato's dialogue and Plato's dialectic. After all, what happens in Plato's dialogues isn't simply that he comes up with uh, more reasonable arguments against his opponent in debate, but that through the expression of the other's contradictions, the other person, the interlocutor, in a sense, runs himself into the ground, puts himself into contradictory positions, and thereby disproves his own theses as being illogical, or, if you will, proves them to be illogical. <clears throat> now, what's important here is that the idea of cunning for Hegel, therefore, is specifically the cunning whereby the true nature of something is revealed by itself. And this doesn't therefore have to be in terms of combat or debate, which of course you might refer to as a rhetorical version of combat or a combat by rhetorical means. You could even say that for Hegel, like the theory of the authentic master functions in the same way, except from a more positive light. For example, the Hegelian theory of the authentic master which I always relate back to Luffy in the One Piece anime or manga, is the idea that the true master doesn't liberate others by means of being forceful. It's not that he's so powerful that he can, you know, uh, release them from their chains, as it were. Instead, it's that the true master acts with such freedom, with such autonomy, that in his very freedom, being absolute, he realizes the freedom in others who see in him a pathway or a release to their own freedom. Think about Luffy in the One Piece anime. Luffy doesn't want to be Pirate King because he wants to be the most powerful. He wants to become the Pirate King because he wants to be the most free. And throughout the beginning, the, the first arcs where he's finding his crewmates, he doesn't simply liberate them 
It said by being almost naively, willfully, optimistically free as to his own power and capability, he sets other people free in themselves. They, they become free because they can become free for themselves. And this is, of course, the Hegelian theory of freedom as well, that something which is free is not just free in itself, but also for itself. The realization of the inner necessity of one's freedom, which therefore compels one to act as if it were an obligation. I have to do this. There is no other way. This, of course, is Hegel's realization or radicalization, if you will, of the Kantian maxim, maxim du kannst denn du sollst, you can because you must. Freedom is therefore a contradictory entity. It's not, I have the freedom to do everything, I'm all powerful. Instead, it's the realization that there's one thing that you have to commit yourself to completely, that you feel like you are compulsively bound to do. Hence also why for Kant, duty is the highest form of freedom. Usually we would see duty and the ethical obligation to do something as being the antithesis to freedom. For example, I have a duty to do my homework, but I don't want to, instead I'd like to play video games. Instead for Kant, the realization of the inner necessity as to one's duty is the highest... Oh, did we lose the connection? I think we're back. The realization... Oh no, Instagram, are you still here? I think we're here. Hello, Instagram, we're back. Instead, the realization of one's own duty as the inner necessity, one's higher necessity, is therefore, for Kant, how one realizes one's freedom. Now, back to the Hegelian theory of the authentic master. The authentic master is therefore not the one who does the act of being free for you, who sets you free, but the one who is in himself so authentically unbound that he therefore refracts onto you the necessity of your own freedom. I think, I think part of it is that one of our devices is receiving a phone call, so I'm going to have to, have to um, take that into account. If you're having trouble on Instagram, I also recommend that you watch the lectures on YouTube because I try to film them on two devices simultaneously. Um, in fact, you can see here my, my impromptu, oh, my impromptu tower <laughs> where I'm recording. Okay, apologies for the poor connection. I hope that we're gonna be able to see this entire thing through. Now, here we have there for, for, for Hegel, one of the, one half of Hegel's idea or concept of the cunning of reason. Namely, cunning is not the same thing as a trick. The second half of the cunning of reason has to do with how Hegel conceptualizes reason. And this is of course the more conceptually, oh, we're losing the connection again. Hi, we're back. And this, of course, is the more conceptually important part for Hegel, Hegel's concept of reason. And the easiest way to understand Hegel's concept of reason is, unfortunately, to look at it in German. Um, because the way in which Hegel contrasts reason is that in the same way that we have the trick versus cunning, right? The trick is simply that you want to fool someone, and cunning is that you have someone fool themselves, essentially. The difference between reason for Hegel and understanding is the difference in German between Vernunft, reason, and Verstand, understanding. Now, understanding for Hegel is a lower form of reason. Understanding is what can be known in the world. It's a form of knowledge. And reason for Hegel is a higher form of knowledge, which isn't strictly speaking self-knowledge, but if you will, the manner in which reason unfolds itself historically. Let me give you a crackpot version of this. Um, there's a beautiful theory about um, a Hegelian reason apropos artificial intelligence. So the basic mechanism of this argument would be that Artificial intelligence completes the dialectical unfolding of reason through spirits. The basic mechanism would be that human beings in discovering logos and language and symbols therefore create the idea of intelligent exchange, the idea of reading and writing and speaking and debating and the foundations upon which civilization is built. And that 
through the creation of artificial intelligence, and let me remind you, this is a slightly crackpot theory, but it's, a, it's an enjoyable one, through the creation of artificial intelligence and the possibility of, uh, of, of a self-aware intelligent being, the idea of a kind of singularity, humans would therefore have finished the role that they had to play. In other words, human beings were simply a vanishing mediator for a higher form of intellect. And therefore, human beings were simply necessary to posit the presuppositions to create the conditions by which an artificial intelligence might be created, and that therefore at the exact moment that the artificial intelligence is, cre is created, human beings are, strictly speaking, no longer needed. There's no biological necessity for human beings to exist. And therefore we would have here for Hegel, and again, this is not Hegel's own theory, but this is something I've seen floating around online, we would have here a kind of Hegelian theory of history, that human intelligence simply serves to posit the presuppositions of a higher form of non-human intelligence. That, if you will, this is the teleological end goal by which history moves forward through contradicting itself. Hence also why it's so important, if you've gone back to the other lectures, to understand the idea of the vanishing mediator. The vanishing mediator is that which realizes its inner necessity through its supposed opposite. It universalizes itself through its apparent negation, to put it more technically. And therein you have again, within the vanishing mediator, what is essentially the logic of the cunning of reason. Remember, in Plato's dialogue, it's not simply that Plato refutes his opponent, it's that he makes his opponent refute himself. The inner necessity or the inner truth of his opponent is revealed through the contradictory exchange, namely the dialectic, the platonic dialectic, that is. Now, for Hegel, something similar therefore happens with reason, uh, with reason as history. If reason is therefore the highest arbiter of history, then history unfolds by means of revealing its inner mechanisms to itself, not being brought to an antithesis by some external force, but instead the self-relating negativity of the historical movement in itself, therefore becoming for itself. Now, that's a lot, so let's, let's take it back a step. Remember, Hegel's two concepts are Verstand and Vernunft. Verstand is understanding, that which you understand or know, if you will, that is the simple positing of finite knowledge in the world, knowledge an sich, things you know, and then there is Vernunft, which is reason. And reason, if you will, is the higher version of understanding. Reason is the central mechanism, the cogs by which history itself turns. In fact, a couple of days ago, I was uh, in Seattle at the Seattle Opera watching uh, a performance of Wagner's, uh, uh, the, first, the first opera in Wagner's ring cycle being Das Rheingold. And within the Rin cycle, we actually see something similar happening in the beginning as to the Hegelian cunning of reason. And it's beautifully staged in the Seattle production. I quite liked it, which is that at the very beginning, when we have the music sort of opening the overture to Das Rheingold, we see on a backdrop projected wheels emerging. And then the wheels turn into cogs and they become interconnected and they start moving. And therefore, the movement of one wheel will create the movement of another wheel. And by the end of it, all the wheels are turning together, as it were. And this is exactly how the plot, then, of the ring functions. It's never simply that one action leads to a specific consequence. In fact, it's almost always the other way around. It's that specific actions will have unintended consequences that thereby reveal the true necessity of the forward movement of the ring itself. In other words, the ring in the ring cycle becomes that around which the energies of the gods and finally the human beings function, whereas the gods see the ring as that which allows them to progress and, be and become more powerful. Of course, there's a similar sentiment in The Lord of the Rings, where in The Lord of the Rings, it's never that the ring simply gives you power to do X. It's very unclear exactly what power you are given. It's not a particular form of power. Instead, it's that the ring will reveal your innermost truth to yourself, of course, in its darkest, most unbridled form, that it therefore taps into that which already is. It's not that the ring functions according to we can now create more in a kind of Faustian pact. It's that the ring is the kind of uh, the, the fetishistic object around which the world historical events revolve. In a sense, the ring could therefore function as ring even if it were not there, even if it were not worn. Now, from a Hegelian perspective, the point here, and I want to be very clear, 
is that for Hegel, history is not predetermined. Often Hegel is characterized as being this philosopher of a kind of mystical, deterministic, absolute knowing by which human beings are mere automata that follow puppet-like in the machinations of a predetermined historical arc. This is also the famous concept of the end of history, if you will. And what's funny here is that actually we could almost allow ourselves a little bit of a pun, a little word joke with the German, which is that in German, end means the, uh, to, to which end something is used. What, oh, we lost the internet again. To which end something is used, what it is used for. It's a teleological proposition. And so you could argue that the end of history is not simply the final point of history, but what is the point of history itself? History in its own becoming, in its own unfolding. And what's key for Hegel here is that while Hegel certainly believes in the idea of a world historical spirit and certain agents who become the particular embodiment of world historical spirit, like when Hegel famously characterizes Napoleon coming into, his, uh, coming into Jena on his steed as being the embodiment of world historical spirit, the point is therefore not that Napoleon had to come into existence, that Napoleon was a kind of historical necessity. The point is almost the exact opposite, which is that it didn't have to be Napoleon. If it weren't Napoleon, it would have been some other guy. That the manifestation of world spirit isn't the identification of one sacred subject who thereby is imbued with power so that he can take upon himself the holy quest of driving forth historical knowledge. Instead, it's that History by itself creates the contradictions through which someone like Napoleon had to emerge through its inner limit. And there's actually, I came across something very similar here recently in a, in, in a, in a, in a book. I forget, oh, we're losing the connection again. Apologies. Very poor connection this morning. Hello, Instagram, we're back. Um, I came across something very similar, although not quite, not quite Hegelian. Uh, and someone will have to correct me as to the name. But I believe it's the guy who was the producer for some of the Jay-Z albums, early Jay-Z work, uh, who's now become a little bit of like a guru figure online with a long beard. Someone will, in the comments will have to tell me exactly what his name is. Anyway, this, this uh, gentleman wrote a book on creativity, which has recently been released and which I was looking through. And in the book on creativity, he says that What's so important about being creative, uh, Rick Rubin, thank you so much to the commenters. Thank you, Rick Rubin. Yes, in Rick Rubin's latest book on creativity, or his new book on creativity, he was arguing that one of the reasons why you have to create, why you have to be creative, is that if you don't do it, if you don't express your idea, somebody else will. In other words, he was quite literally in the passage saying that in a certain historical constellation, the moment which you are living in, there are certain ideas that have to be creatively expressed, that there's almost an inner historical necessity for these ideas to come into existence. We've lost the connection again. Let's see. Hello, Instagram, we're back. Pardon me on YouTube. I'm doing Instagram and YouTube at the same time. So there's certain, there's a historical necessity for certain creative ideas to come into existence. And that if it's not you who articulates them, then it will be someone else. That this idea will come into existence whether it's channeled through you or through someone else. Now, what I like about this idea is that on the one hand, it works a little bit as a self-help maxim about the necessity of action and leaping into the creative spirit so that somebody else doesn't do it before you. But on the other hand, we have here an articulation of what is a form of the cunning of reason. The cunning of reason, I'm just freezing because we're losing the connection. I'm so sorry. The cunning of reason isn't simply how history identifies one creative individual who thereby embodies the world historical spirit. It's that strictly speaking, it doesn't matter who does it. The idea will make itself manifest through someone. And Strictly speaking, it doesn't matter if it's you or somebody else. The person who comes up with the idea, who follows it through, is thereby the necessary figure, the world historical spirit of this idea. In other words, it didn't have to be Napoleon. It simply was Napoleon. 
You could also say that from like a science fiction time travel scenario, there's always these ideas about what if we went back in time and killed Hitler when he was a baby? And strictly speaking, from a Hegelian perspective, even if you were to go back in time and kill Hitler, there would simply be somebody else who would become Hitler, except his name wouldn't be Hitler, his name would be Hans or something like this. Heil Hans, right? Anyway, I don't mean to make jokes about this. But the point here is that, we're losing the connection, apologies. The point here is that for Hegel, history doesn't unfold as a kind of invisible hand of God that manipulates everything. Even though the invisible hand of God is supposedly supposed to be an economic theory by which everything balances out into a kind of preordained equilibrium, Hegel's point is precisely the opposite. There is no equilibrium. The only consistency is inconsistency. The only order is chaos. And precisely within these contradictions, a kind of inner necessity emerges, a kind of through line, as it were. And that historical figures who thereby channel historical ideas, and if you will, historical energy, are thereby how history re reveals itself to itself. And of course, thereby fades away, as it were. Um, there's a beautiful example of this in the Blade Runner sequel. Uh, if you've seen it, the Blade Runner sequel, I believe it's called, what is it? Blade Runner 20, Blade Runner 2049. There's a beautiful example of this in the, in the Blade Runner sequel, where the main character, K, uh, who's a replicant, at a certain point in the film, believes that he is, in fact, the son of Deckard, that he is the child of prophecy, that he is the hidden, uh, the hidden uh, I don't know, a, a chosen one, as it were, a cinematic trope, right? And the way in which he believes this is that he discovers that he has memories and then goes into the world and finds evidence, physical material evidence of those memories, like a little play horse that he's buried away in a mine somewhere. And he uses these memories to thereby suggest to himself that he is the chosen one, that he is the son of Deckard. However, in a beautiful reversal, in a properly Hegelian dialectical twist, he realizes at the end of the movie, spoilers for Blade Runner 2049, he realizes at the end of the film that what has happened is that the true child of Deckard has implanted her memories into all the other replicants. In other words, has provided them with an ideological fantasy frame through which each and every one of them thinks that they are the chosen one, that they are the son of Deckard. And that therefore, the necessity of discovering who they are truly, namely replicants working for the system, has to go through the false cognition of thinking that they are the exception to the rule. And what's beautifully dialectical about this is that the realization that they are the rule has to go through the failed realization that they are the exception to the rule. And of course, the movie has like a beautiful dialectical closing moment where at the end of the film, it is Kay who thereby acts as a son to Deckard, saving him and himself dying so that Deckard might meet and be reunited with his lost daughter. And so here we have, if you will, the perfect example of the Hegelian cunning of reason. It's through the passion, through the error, through the cognitive misperception of K, who believes that he is the son of Deckard, that Deckard is reunited with his daughter. That necessary misrecognition thereby leads to the true cognition of the overall historical necessity developing through the story, if you will. Um, the reason that this is the Hegelian cunning of reason isn't simply that we have a predetermined historical arc that is made manifest through uh, Kay's misrecognition of himself as the chosen one, but specifically that Kay is the world historical individual who is nevertheless completely and entirely disposable because he, like every other replicant, believes that they are the chosen one and it is only once they have realized that they are not that they are able to wake up into autonomous selfhood and join the resistance movement, the free freedom movement, etc. Now, what's so... I hope that you're still with me, because I know this is a lot, but we're going to have three months to, to you know, really um, dig into this concept, which I think is very rich. What's important here is that the Hegelian cunning of reason, the List der Vernunft, 
therefore does not argue that history has a preordained necessity. We've lost the connection, excuse me. Hegel does not argue. Oh, I hope we're back online. Oh no, we seem to have lost the connection. Apologies. I hope it won't be like this every week. I think we're back. No, we're not back yet. I do apologize for the poor connection. I don't know why it's so bad today. Let's see if we can change it. Pause due to poor connection. We may simply have to stop the Instagram video at some point. We'll see. I hope everybody can take a little breather at this point. Let's see if we're back online. No. Might be because I'm in the basement, to be honest. At least YouTube seems to be working. Hello, everybody. Am I back? I'm back. Uh, poor connection. I think I'm here. Okay, we're gonna, we're gonna keep trying. Thank you so much for sticking with me. Please know that if you are on Instagram and experiencing technical difficulties, you can always go over to YouTube where we seem to have a much better connection. Uh, my YouTube is Julian de Medeiros. So simply go to YouTube um, and you'll be able to find a better connection. Thank you so much. Now, the point here is that from a Hegelian perspective, history is therefore not following a preordained arc that leads towards a historical endpoint or end goal. Usually this is characterized as absolute knowing, a kind of messiah-like moment by which reason clicks and everything is revealed to us. And yet, instead of this idea of a kind of monstrous mystical Hegel, a Hegel of absolute knowing, the only thing that is absolute for Hegel is precisely this incompleteness, this if you will, radical, contradictory nature or unfolding of reason through history, revealing itself in itself to itself, always one step too late. It is, if you will, the useless precaution. It's also why one of my favorite examples uh, comes from the idea of like, if you go back to Italian comedic operas, Italian comedic operas, uh, or even like a Commedia dell'arte, like uh, theatrical productions, always function in a very simple sense that we often see today in soap operas, which is that one character wants one thing and the other wants the opposite. And because you have two characters who want contradictory things, it means that there will be tension and drama will ensue and you will have a plot. And yet what's beautiful about Commedia dell'arte, which we've seen comedic opera as well, is that every time one character tries to thwart the other, he only further succeeds in helping that character. Think about a father who doesn't want his daughter to be with some young man. Well, the more the father doesn't want the daughter to be with that young man, the more he's essentially encouraging the daughter to be with that young man to rebel against the father. Here, the very prohibition against being with the lover will precisely create the conditions by which the lover emerges as a desirable partner in the first place. Here we again have the Hegelian cunning of reason, or the dialectical unfolding of what you might call a kind of unity of opposites. If the father had simply said, go and be with whoever you'd like to be, she probably would say, no, father, I'd like to be with you. But the father says, you cannot be with your boyfriend, thereby precisely creates the preconditions by which he wants to be with the boyfriend. Here we essentially have um, what I like to refer to as the useless precaution. The very thing which stands as an obstacle becomes the inner unfolding, the thing which creates the pathway to its realization. And I believe we have once again lost the internet. I am so sorry. It's, there's nothing I can do about it. And the point, therefore, is that the Hegelian cunning of reason, the list der Vernunft, is not an overarching grand narrative about the deterministic nature of history by which we're all simply walking towards a historical finite endpoint in which absolute knowing will be realized and we will have come to know ourselves and the universe will have come to know itself through us, uh, the mere pawns of its unfolding. Instead, Hegel's argument about the cunning of reason is a proposition about dialectics, about the dialectical unfolding of knowledge through history. 
And this is why Hegel's maxim about the Owl of Minerva is so important, specifically when you see it through the lens. We've lost it. The Hegel's maxim of the Owl of Minerva is so important, specifically when you see it through the lens of Hegel's theory of history. The maxim is, the Owl of Minerva only takes flight at dusk. In other words, understanding comes too late. And here one has to be very, very specific as to what Hegel means. Hegel believed that one cannot predict the future, that the task of philosophy is never to try to analyze what might come next, that instead the task of philosophy is to think that which can only be understood in the present moment, in the unfolding of what is as of yet not understood to us right now. And that therefore our understanding will always come too late. This is not, let me be very clear, this is not hindsight is 2020. This is not that once something has happened, we can see it more clearly in the past. Um, a friend of mine recently said something which I thought was surprising. He said, I can't wait for it to be 50 years from now because then I can read a history book about what happened and everything will become clear to me. I thought that was such a surprising sentiment that everything in the present is muddled, but that we can rely upon the but that we can rely upon the historical authority of future journalists and historians to clear it up for us, as it were, as it becomes revealed to us. For Hegel, that that is absolutely not true. For Hegel, there's never a point at which we can properly assess the situation, except from within the properly contradictory moment of its own unfolding or its own becoming. In other words, the less clear something is to us now, the more revelatory it is, according to Hegel. That it's precisely within the contradictions and precisely within the things that we cannot make sense of that a kind of sense is revealed to us. And the task of philosophy for Hegel is therefore not to engage in a kind of obscurantist, mystical, divination as to where history might be leading, but instead to constantly interrogate critically the present as it is revealing its clues to us, almost like a murder mystery, except we cannot yet see them for what they are. It's also why like, and this, I don't mean to make this about Zizek, but Zizek has argued that Hegel is a theory, a theorist of irony, that Hegel believes that history unfolds as a kind of cosmic joke, Think about it. In a joke, you have to go through every aspect of the joke in order for it to make sense at the end. And this is, you know, you'll, you'll tell a joke to someone and there's that moment where it hasn't clicked yet. The moment where you're putting together the pieces and then through the process of putting together the pieces, the underlying joke the quote-unquote hidden message of the joke is revealed, and you have the aha moment where it becomes funny. And so you couldn't simply skip to the end. You couldn't simply have the punchline. You would have to go through all the pre... I don't know what you would call it, like the pre-propositions in order to get to that point whereby it becomes funny. Hegel's argument about history is similar. You can't jump to the end. You can't simply deduct where it's all going. Instead, you have to go through the cosmic roller coaster of the posit of the pre uh, excuse me, of what Hegel calls the positing of the presuppositions, by which the contradictory unfolding of those myriad layers will eventually lead to the aha moment by which it reveals itself in its true nature, always too late, always retroactively. Hence, why the Owl of Minerva only takes flight at dusk. Cognition necessarily occurs at the exact moment at which it comes too late, at which it is delayed. However, this is not a pessimistic theory that Hegel has. It's said to go back to Rick Rubin's idea about creativity and why you should create something before somebody else does. It's, to my mind, a very optimistic idea of history about the absolute autonomy and agency of the individual subject to think and act according to the coordinates that could only be known to you today. That your ethical obligation as a subject is precisely to inquire, to investigate, to be curious and critical all the time, 
to think that which could only be thought by you in the present moment. This is your privilege. Your privilege is that you can write and think and speak the things that people who were not yet born cannot and people who have already lived will never be able to. That within your finite existence, you therefore have a refraction of the infinite in your ethical obligation to create, to think, to write, to discuss, to be a knowing subject. And the understanding that history moves through you is therefore not the psychotic assumption that there is some puppet master who is leading you to act in accordance to his will, but precisely the opposite. That in the absence of any kind of predetermined historical agency, it is only up to you to be the agent of historical unfolding. Not to be trite here, but be the change you would like to see in the world. Nobody will do it for you. Hegel is one of the most profoundly liberating thinkers because what appears to be a mystical absolutist theory of the predetermined unfolding of history is in fact the exact opposite. It's about the absolute, undeterring, eternal necessity of individual subjectivity to grasp and shape and create the world around you. And that therein lies the undeterred unfolding of historical spirit, which will yet reveal itself to you as the contradictions continue to unfold. That your obligation is to act, to take it all in, to live, to experience, to write, to create, to share. And to my mind, that's what makes Hegel such an interesting thinker, is that the Hegelian dialectic is never about calculating where life is going. It's about embracing the fact that you cannot know what is happening until it is too late. And that therefore you have two choices. Choice number one, to simply sit back and watch it unfold or to become the active agent of it, to realize it, to, if you will, realize the inner necessity of history through the realization of the inner necessity of yourself. And whilst that might sound grandiose, it's actually a very humbling experience. It means that you can bring into the world that which you find important. You can put your fingers on the scale of historical development by means of insisting on the necessity of your own action. And if enough people do that together, then it leads to what will retroactively appear as a historical necessity. Think about an election. Every time an election takes place, we don't know what's going to happen. We're not, we're not pre, like, there's no way we can see the future. We can't see who's going to win in an election. And yet, the next day, everybody in the world who knows the outcome, every journalist, every politician, every member of the public will pretend that it was always meant to be. It had to happen like this. Of course, the writing was on the wall. And this is, to my mind, very inspirational and motivational, which is that if you enact the change you would like to see, the universe will shrug. The universe will say, well, yeah, of course, this is where it was leading up to. Let's say that you're in a sports team and you really want to be the champion at the end of your season. Nobody's going to pick you as the champion in the beginning. But once you've worked your way up to becoming champion, everyone will say, yeah, that guy had it easy. You know, he had it figured out. That person was always meant to be a champion. And that's not how it works. Most people begin with a lack of talent. Most people are not in any way suited to do anything extraordinary. We've lost the connection. In fact, let's see if there's the connection coming back. I apologize to YouTube for interrupting the flow. Ah, oh, this is so painful. Are we back? Are we back? We'll see. We're almost done. So thank you for sticking with me. I think we're almost back. Are we almost back? Are we here? Almost? I'm moving my fingers to see. Okay, we're back. Most, and we're not back. Okay, I'm just gonna finish. Most people who are talented, and this is totally fine, no judgment, but most people who are talented don't necessarily have the drive to see their talent through to do something extraordinary. Whereas it's often precisely the people who have no innate talent, who nevertheless have the absolute will 
to achieve something, who become great, who are able to persevere. In other words, the quote-unquote world historical spirit of greatness isn't preordained in that someone has the God-given talent to become the best. It's that the person who so relentlessly, subjectively asserts their own inner necessity through drive and will, thereby retroactively appears as the one who had to succeed, who was already the best. And this is what's so important about the Hegelian cunning of reason. It's that you can't simply assume that the future is a given. You can't simply assume that we all know where we're heading. In fact, the only thing you can assume is that unless you make it happen, it will not happen. Or, more importantly, unless you make it happen, someone else will make it happen. And that therefore, the only ethical obligation that you have as an individual is to understand the moment you are living in so that you might navigate it in the way that is uniquely, subjectively, your privilege to do. And I don't want to turn that into a self-help maxim, but I do think that it's important that we understand the retroactive revelation of history, which is that in retrospect, it always appears inevitable that something happened. And this is precisely the revolutionary premise, namely taking something which seemed completely not inevitable and making it seem inevitable after the fact. This had to have occurred. And for Hegel, this is the Ouroboros movement, the dialectical movement of history biting its own tail. That it's not predetermined, but that instead history using human passion, human subjectivity, reveals its inner end, its inner working to itself through subjective consciousness. And finally, we have here, of course, for those of you who are familiar with Hegel, the Hegelian ontological principle, which is that it's not substance versus subject, it's substance equals subject, or the ontological maxim that the fall retroactively generates that from which it is falling. The same is true for history. History is not a priori on sich. Instead, through the fall into contingent subjectivity, history emerges after the fact, retroactively. The truth of history emerges through its negation into particular subjectivity. And so within the cunning of reason, we see once again the Hegelian onto ontological principle. That is the cunning of reason, die List der Vernunft. And it is my great pleasure to say, to announce, that for the next three months, on a weekly basis, we're going to be diving into this concept. We're going to be examining it from every possible angle. And if you'd like to join me for this lecture series for the next three months, simply tune in on YouTube and Instagram, or you can also download the lectures on Patreon, as well as my supplementary learning materials and my complete Guide to Zizek ebook. Most of all, I'd like to invite you to our learning community on Patreon because it's a fun place to be and it helps me keep making these lectures. So thank you guys so much for joining me. I apologize about the technical difficulties. Hopefully it will be better next week. Um, but the show must go on. This has been the first in the new series titled The Cunning of Reason on the Hegelian Dialectic. And I'm so excited about continuing in this journey with you. For patrons and Substack subscribers, I'll be hosting a Q&A discussion in which I want to talk about the Wes Anderson movie, Asteroid City. Uh, that's going to start in about five minutes on Discord. So if you'd like to join that or download it as a members-only podcast, simply go to www.patreon.com forward slash Julian Philosophy. On that note, thank you guys so much, and I will see you next week.